We're live over here. Sorry, Rose, behind you. Behind you. Yeah. Okay. We're having difficulty with this one. All right. Okay, hi. This is uh, Rose Daytalk Doll, and we're here uh, live streaming our figure drawing and painting workshop at Southern Virginia University in Guadalajara. So, what we have here today is um, I'm, what we're going to accomplish today in the demo that I'm going to do here from 2 to 5 is I'm going to um, do both a pastel drawing demo and an oil painting demo. And I'm going to do very quick studies of each um, because I am going to talk about the relationship of, of drawing to painting. And I get a lot of students who, who are really good um, draftsmen, but they don't know how to make the connection from drawing to painting. So um, that's what I'm going to do today. First thing I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be doing a pastel uh, drawing, and some people call them pastel paintings for that reason because you can, pastel is the perfect bridge between um, uh, painting and drawing. So, and it's a great, because um, you jump into color, and um, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to jump into color, but um, we're going to, I'm going to show how um, you can maintain your drawing quality, your linear quality, um, in your oil painting, and loosen up. That's kind of, um, um, our object today is what you're looking for in your figure drawing or figure painting is to loosen up, then that's what we're going to do. This is not an anatomy course. This is, um, um, this is strictly a, a three-day um, course on how to, to loosen up, how to freshen up, and to be more direct and to get over certain skin conditions when you're approaching um, a, uh, doing an, uh, either a drawing or a painting. So a lot of people when they start out get really intimidated with an empty page. And so um, what I, I'm telling my um, students, we have some students here who are um, who are beginners and we have some who are intermediate and we have some professional artists too. So it's a really, really fun um, workshop. It's a really fun group and everybody's different and everybody's I mean, at this workshop um, in a different place. But if you're totally beginning, you don't know where to begin, um, what I would say first is pretend you're like you're looking through a camera lens, and um, and if you don't have a, a, a viewfinder, you can use your hands, and you probably have seen that. You've seen people really try and, um, and do this. Um, it's not cliche. There's a, there's, a, there's a purpose behind that, and that is so that you can um, define your composition. And so that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm kind of probably uh, focusing more on the test of Michaela, our model, today. And um, we spent a lot of time, we spent a bunch of time with my students actually preparing the setup, the model setup. Um, too often, um, uh, people assume that pop somebody in front of you and you magically come up with this amazing drawing. Sometimes that happens, sometimes that does, but more often than not, um, the person painting the artist is usually paying close attention to the angle, to the lighting, to the whole setup. And so we, um, angling the lighting, where, how she's sitting, and until we got her in what we call the sweet spot and where you're sitting in a sweet spot. So that's really important. Um, it just doesn't happen. Um, I, there tends to be a lot more thought on the front end than people would think. So basically what I'm doing right now, I'm just jumping right in and I am uh, I'm mapping out my composition. So I kind of move her over to the right hand side because I kind of want to get this part of her shoulder I, I kind of want a little bit more more dynamic system than I'm having right in the middle of my drawing. So right now, and uh, this is what I told uh, my students earlier that I'll go ahead and tell you, is that when you're sitting down to draw your model, you want to be completely comfortable. You don't want to be moving your head a lot. The only thing that you want to be doing, um, if you're right hand, you should probably cut everything here with an arm reach of your right hand. And then um, your head isn't really going to be moving because you don't want 
one GB point of view. Um, I had the request that I address how you capture likeness. And this is one of the key things that you need to do is to um, be relaxed, but don't be moving around and changing your point of view. And then um, the only thing that's really going to be moving back and forth, you won't be seeing me move my catalog unless I'm trying to face the camera. Um, you won't be seeing me move around trying to maybe to come around and reach your, um, some, some of my brushes or my pastels. So um, right now, I'm gonna, my eye is going to be scanning back and forth between my model. And uh, my paper. And to be honest, your eye really should be more on your paper or your canvas. And uh, right now, I'm just sort of letting my hand record. Now, the temptation is for uh, students to go in and what do you think artists or novices uh, do first? What, what feature do uh, students just jump into and draw? Throw it out there. What feature? The eyes. The eyes. The eyes. Okay, I want you to refrain from jumping in and just doing the eyes. I want you to actually map it out. Map out your composition. You can't do this. There's time to go to, it, to do your eyes. But actually, eyes are one of the last things I do. The eyeballs are one of the last things I do. I map everything out first. And I'm also staying very, very loose. I'm, I'm staying loose because, um, guess what? Uh, we're early on. I'm going to probably make some adjustments um, later. So my, my lines are very loose. I may come and make some adjustments. That's just going to happen. So even if you feel like, oh no, I, um, I maybe didn't make the training big enough. I need to add a little bit more. If I don't commit to really super hard permanent lines yet until you are a little bit more solid. So you have to stay loose, stay loose and fluid and really let your eye, your eye, like your hand is just touching what your eyes are Again, because this is a three-day course, we're not really going to be doing an anatomy and intensive study um, in terms of this is not, we're not going to sit there and kind of label each, um, each muscle and each bone. That's not, it's just too much to cover in three days. But I will tell you that the more you just rely upon what you see, all what you see, um, and not what you think you see, but pretty much your hand just before what you see. If you're looking more at your paper and your eye looking back and forth. And you will have a more accurate likeness if you just trust in that process. It may not look like a full in the beginning, but you'll start to see your, your lines come together. And see, it's starting to emerge, emerge already. Now, uh, a little word about the paper that I'm using here. I'm using uh, hands-on colored paper. Uh, most students just, they just uh, begin on white paper. Everybody begins on the pencil paper. And this is one way to sort of break out of just pencil paper. And then it jump into color. And if anybody's familiar with my own artwork, um, I use a lot of color. Oh, fantastic. Okay, we're taking a second here. And I'm going to use this one. Okay. 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 Um, uh, um, influence on the choice um, of color of paper uh, but basically what I chose more importantly than color is 
the value. This is sort of a medium value uh, paper, meaning when I say value, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, value is the lightness or darkness of a color. And I didn't want to do anything too dark because then I would have had to fight with um, totally blocking out this black paper and just would have had to layer, layer, layer on top of it. And I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to have to fight with my paper. I don't want to have to fight with what's underneath. Um, but hopefully this is sort of this foundation. It bumps up the color right away when you use color. And um, I, I love color. I'm kind of a color addict. Um, and it might be complete foreign language to some people, and that's, you know, everybody's sort of beginning in a different place. But what we're doing right here, right now, is um, um, before we start talking about color, um, I'm what I'm doing again is just mapping, mapping. I'm I'm considering um, the placement of everything, and that's what I mean by mapping. And so it's given me a good foundation. These are the bare bones of my drawing, and I've still left it loose enough, so if I need to make some adjustments, they can happen. And I, there will be adjustments. That just is the way it happens. It, it, it's just the way it is. And so don't get thrown by that if um, you find that you're going to have to make some adjustments. Um, a little. On, I hope, hopefully I'm not having to make major adjustments at this point because I've been – just training my eye on her and flicking my eye back and forth and, and seeing if, um, if you're familiar with animation and um, animators flip back and forth their, their drawings as they're animating it to see if the, it moves and if it's your, the, the model lines up with the next drawing. Uh, the, uh, so it's kind of the same concept. Your eye is flipping, flipping back and forth to see if... The image that you're drawing or painting superimposes on her, and that's why staying in a, a, a the same spot is really important. And that you're not tilting your head up and down, you're not moving too much, but still you've got to be really relaxed because if you're going to be here for a while, you've got to be comfortable, um, and and ultimately because my goal is uh, hopefully to get you to to enhance your fluidity in your drawing. You want to be relaxed and you're not going to have a fluid drawing if you're if you're uncomfortable or if your your neck is torqued because you're turned a certain way and you're 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 um um you're reaching wrong. We want to be ergonomic <laughs> somewhat. So, okay. Um a word of the okay, I am using some Prismacolor new pastels and um Prismacolor is just, is just a brand. You probably are familiar with Prismacolor pencils um, for those who are illustrators or um, those who like to draw uh, can readily recognize the brand. Um, but they also make pastels, and they call, they're call new pastels, and they're slightly less dusty than your, your, um, your, chalk, your regular chalk pastels, and that's kind of why I like them. And... Um, they are, stay within the same color family as their pencils. So sometimes, even though their color pencils are more waxy, you can maybe cut in and do some detail. And pastels also force you to be loose because you just cannot get hyper detail. Um, and that, I think, is something that um, is part of this exercise, is to break you out of being too myopic, too too narrowed in on one thing and being so um, 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 closed in on this on detail and then everything else when you move outside of that the the face or the eyes and things start to fall apart we want to avoid that we want to consider the whole consider the whole from the beginning and um, you'll just have a better more loose more fluid drawing hopefully so, okay, now um, what I um, could do at this point now, um, to simplify things here, and this also applies for if you're going to be doing a monochromatic drawing, which means only you're only using like one color. You're going to use, let's say, white and an umber or um, black and white or whatever. Um, that's a monochromatic um, 
um, but it, um, whether we're talking about monochromatic or we're talking about color, um, and we're talking about some, we're going to talk about capturing the values right now. Um, one key to loosening up here is let's not make this too complicated for ourselves. So just concentrate on three values. You want to concentrate on your darkest dark, concentrate on your medium value, meaning, and again, value means the darkness or the lightness. Concentrate on your, your dark, a medium, and then your light. Um, and, and then everything else kind of will just fall into place. It just makes things more simple. Another um, key to just keeping it loose, you don't want to make things complicated. Um, we're, um, this is sort of the wrong workshop if you want a super hyper-realistic, although we're talking about representational. Uh, I, I don't really consider myself a realist, um, um, although maybe from a, um, an untrained eye it might be considered somewhat realistic, and, but uh, not photorealistic. So, um, okay, so we're talking a little bit about value here. But before I jump in, now earlier I had done a drawing where I went in and I went and started putting the values in. Um, this right here, I have started out with a, um, uh, I, could say, I would say it's like a burnt umber color. And when I go to painting, I'm going to actually use a very similar color in painting when I'm doing my, just my drawing underneath the painting. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that drawing because I just jump right in. We just want to jump right in. Um, I'm not, because I'm going to invariably paint over all the shadows. I'm going to paint over, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint over anything that I go in and put in detail at this point. And the same thing uh, applies to pastel because we're going to approach this like a painting. Now, um, okay, so I feel like I'm in a pretty good place. I'm sort of going to just put in a little bit of value, but I'm not going to put a ton because, like I said, I'm, I'm going to probably end up going over it. But right now, I'm sort of capturing where the shadows, when you're looking at shadows, you know, if you're having trouble identifying which shadows to include, um, squint your eye at the model and put her out of focus. And you'll, the, the shadows that need to be indicated will jump out at you. And the ones that aren't important will just drop off the wagon and won't be important. You won't need to include them. And I guess you could say we're sort of capturing the impression, although I wouldn't say that this is impressionistic, but it may have some similarities to at least the idea of capturing an impression. Impressionism was um, in the 19th century where they were capturing the effect of light and color on canvas um, in France. This was a big movement, although it wasn't really popular <laughs> um, until much later. It wasn't very vogue. They were kind of rejected at first. But now it's so much a part of the artistic vocabulary that it's hard to fathom that at one point people were like, no, I'm not into that. I, it's not, it's not uh, photorealistic, and people's tastes were not just not accustomed to it. Okay, so I've started to put um, a little bit of value in here. Okay. So what I'm going to do, again, because I have a colored background and her skin is not blue, I am going to have to do some layering. And um, what I'm reaching for here is it, we have a, a, the light on her is very warm. So I'm going to pick some warm colors. I usually am loath to pick your um, what's labeled as flesh tone but it's pretty darn warm and uh, is actually is kind of on the yellow side so what I'm gonna go do here is I'm gonna pick a medium value I'm gonna pick a medium value for her skin tone and I'm just gonna start blocking it in it's gonna be pretty pretty radical and it's just a second when I jump in and I'm just gonna go for it 
and um, you'll see why. Um, after I, s uh, so just trust me, it's going to look pretty crazy in a second. But I love using colored paper because, um, and like I use colored canvas because your your color is just going to pop right off of that. Um, so I'm just going to, yeah, that's a little bit too, too um, yellow. So I can make some adjustments. And the nice thing about um, Prismacolors is that you can blend, you can use your finger. Um, or you can just use it straight up. And I'm just going to go ahead. I told you I was going to block out a lot. And that's fine if you don't like doing that approach. But that's just sort of the way I do it. But you see, I still, the reason why I put a little bit of, of, um, of the value, I started putting this medium value underneath is because I knew it, I wouldn't lose it completely. I totally would not lose it completely. Um, but there's still enough of a ghost of it there that I have, um, that I can still work with it. And it's still mapped out. Okay. And I will do the, a very similar approach when I'm painting. I'll go ahead and block out that, um, that flesh tone pretty early on. <laughs> now, a word about lighting here. Um, and a word about color. Now, when you select your colors, now I want you to be aware that whatever color you colors you select, um, they need to be able to fit within the same color universe on your canvas or your paper. And what I mean by that is that when you're looking at blue, it's usually not going to be the blue that comes straight from the tube. It's very rarely, and the reason is because light will hit your subject, your model, and it will alter it. And it will alter that blue to either be a warm blue of her outfit or a cool blue. Likewise, likewise with her flesh tone, it's all about light. It is all about light. And so um, this this um, burnt umber that I've used underneath, it's a really nice universal color, although it's a bit, it's sorry, burnt umber is a bit warmer than raw umber. I used to use raw umber a lot, but I used to feel like I couldn't pull enough contrast out of this. And all you notice that I'm not actually using black. And I'm not going to use black on my on my in my pastel palette and I'm not going to use it in my oil palette because I can mix an approximation of black with my other colors because black to me doesn't fit in the color universe that um, is going to happen on my painting. So you'll find none of my paintings. If you ever look on Instagram, you look on Facebook, if you look at any of those drawings or paintings, there is the total absence of black, but you might not know it. Um, there's enough edge work in there, and you would think that they were black because you can mix something that's more rich than um, your blacks, and blacks will make everything muddy. Umber, this raw, this burnt umber, is is pretty nice and universal in that it it won't make your flesh tones too muddy. It's still it and it's warm enough so that when you blend it, um, it's still. Um, under normal lighting circumstances, um, it's a it's a good choice to do your drawing, your underpainting, and um, you see it's starting to happen already. This is like coming together already, and it's very very direct. Um, I don't I don't ever spend a, a lot of time doing an underpainting because, like I said, <laughs> you just end up painting over it, right? 
Um, but I do enough of a foundation that I can just launch right in and that I'm responding to the light and color in front of me and just trusting my eye. I'm just going to trust my eye to, to draw what I see, okay? This is a nice medium value, a lightish medium value um, that I've chosen for her skin tone. I didn't go too light. Just make note of that. I didn't go too light yet because I want to be able to make those highlights pop. And what I mean by highlights is when you squint your eye and you look at Michaela, you want to see what are those whitest whites that pop out. Maybe it's like there's a little bit on her forehead and a little bit on, on, the, on her brow and a little bit on her nose and right here on her cheekbone. Those are the things that I'm going to want to pop out later. And, and there's, it's still uh, light enough that I can go and pull some darker values um, later as I start to pick out more uh, detail. So happening really, really fast. Um, it's, I'm staying super loose. Uh, I love the fun things that you could do with hair. And as things reflect off of hair, um, you get different colors coming in. And, and then we'll add those later. Now, a word about red. Remember how I was talking about things need to be in the same color universe? Like black, which is so jarring and contrasty, I don't feel like it, it comfortably sits. Now, people use black to mix with their colors. There's plenty of artists who use black. I'm just not one of them, and that's fine. Um, some artists really just love to pull their super, super dark, dark darks and their um, light lights. Um, I just have never been able to make black work on my paintings. And every, to each his own or her own. And um, you, have, you just sort of find what works for you. But I just have found that I fight with black more than it helps my painting. So and then red. I was talking about red. Red is the same thing. You really have to be careful about red. Red is just going to pop off of your canvas and your paper. It's just almost too much. So you might have to tone down your reds. Um, or you just use a touch of red here and there. Um, OK, I'm sort of at a point now where I'm going to um, Start picking out a little bit. Now I'm nudging, nudging this a little bit more. I should probably check my time, see how we're doing. Oh, we've only been going on this for about 20 minutes, and it's already coming together. So um, we're in a pretty good place because we're also, stay tuned, don't like go away too quick because we're going to do um, an oil painting demo of the same pose, and I'm going to show you the relationship and this, uh, uh, of a, a similarity in approach of doing a pastel painting and an oil painting. Now, when I say oil painting, that's the medium of my choice. Um, the same thing would apply to an acrylic painting. But um, I used to do acrylic painting, and um, it's, it's fine. But I found that some of the colors really would dry a different color. And it would totally frustrate me. And um, phalo, for instance, would just take over. So I kind of switched to uh, oil painting because I found that that was, became less of an issue. And, and of course, you know, I was doing acrylics back in, like, the 1990s. And maybe, maybe they've come a long ways. I don't know because I haven't been acrylic painting. And there are diehard acrylic painters out there. And uh, I often do an acrylic underpainting. But I don't do it as my primary um, end product medium. I do an acrylic. Um, I tint my canvas with acrylic. And it dries fast. I, my personal preference um, is not to work wet on wet. There are plenty of artists out there who like to work wet on wet. Um, it doesn't really work for me. 
uh, I'm a very direct painter and so I when I mix my color and when I lay it down I don't want it to have to mix with what's underneath and then be like oh that threw me so uh, that's just my personal preference but there are plenty of artists out there who love to work wet on wet and it works for them and um, so you kind of have to find what works for you but um, so see I'm already here picking out detail a little bit not getting too married to it making adjustments and you can layer pastels like you would layer um, a painting that's uh, why you um, you can you can um, color on top and and make the adjustments that you need just like you would in a painting so I'm ever nudging it closer to um, a more finished look. But it's still really loose. And um, I pretty much have not gotten into too much color. Now, if you are familiar with John Singer Sargent and you look at his uh, beautiful paintings. Uh, his portraiture is just unrivaled. His bravado style um, paintings are just really, uh, they are the go-to for the contemporary portrait artist. He is the most sought after and chased after um, painter, a uh, portrait painter, I should say in terms of trying to replicate the magic that he achieves on canvas. His fluidity, his brush stroke is just unrivaled and his accuracy at just capturing likeness with very, very little effort um, is just, it's just magical. And if you look at how he approaches flesh tone you know, he starts out with something that's, again, not going to be your flesh tint that's directly from the tube. Uh, I find that the flesh tint is not your, is not going to be uh, one-stop shopping for all flesh tones in all situations. And I rarely ever reach for it when I'm doing flesh tone. More than likely, when I get to my canvas, I'll use a lot of either permalba white or... Um, 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 titanium white. I actually have titanium white on my on my palette. We'll get to it in a minute, uh, more than a minute, <laughs> um, but not too long. Um, I use titanium white. I use alizarin crimson. Um, sometimes I use yellow ochre or Naples yellow, and that's kind of your classic approach to flesh tint. Um, now we've done some things. We've actually uh, added a lighting gel to um, our lighting here. We've added a rosy colored lighting gel. Um, and so maybe that flesh tint from the tube, uh, which is usually very, very pink and very red, almost too red for most situations, it somehow works here. So, um, okay. So now, um, I'm about ready to start adding a little bit more color. And I can add a little bit more red um, to this. I'm going to hold back on my reds a little bit. I hold my red in reserve. Um, and I'm going to carefully pick uh, the reds that I'm going to be using here. All right. Now, Sargent, because I had mentioned him with regard to flesh tone, is that often what he would do is he would take, like, I suspect that his palette was, like I had mentioned, using a titanium white. He probably used alizarin crimson. He probably used burnt umber. And he probably used, an, uh, you know, maybe a yellow ochre or a Naples yellow um, as sort of the basis in whatever quantity he would, depending on if it's a warm flesh tone or a cool flesh tone. But, um, um, his, and we're, we're only talking about pale skin. We're not talking about like dark skin 
uh, which is a whole nother uh, a whole nother ball of wax, which is wonderful and fun to play with um, light and how it reflects off of dark darker complexions. And um, that's a subject for a whole nother day. But for the pale for for pale Caucasian skin, um, that's kind of a a good place to start is um, using uh, titanium white and alizarin crimson. Again, this is a little bit more rosy, but what Sargent would often do is he would go in and then he would just take his reds and just pull out a few reds in a few places. My finger was a little dirty there. <laughs> so I'm gonna go have to, I'm gonna have to go and adjust that. I'm actually at the same time, I can, I'm at a place now where I can start picking out some highlights. We've been going at this for mm, almost a half hour, maybe not quite. It's pretty, not bad huh, for half hour, um, half hour drawing. Uh, but I'm probably, I'm just showing you this approach here because it's going to be so similar to how I approach oil painting. And so you see the relationship of drawing and maintaining that drawing quality. Really drawing is a foundation for everything. And um, if you have an opportunity to take a drawing class where you take observational drawing or human figure drawing class, and um, I would say um, do it. Uh, take that opportunity to do it. And um, get the more, the more you draw and paint the human figure, the better you will get at it. Um, there's really not a whole lot of ways around that. Um, doing your time, doing it, and uh, it will pay off. You'll get more and more familiar with the structure of the, the body, the face. And I, at this point here too, I can make my darks darker and my lights lighter and uh, just nudge it ever so close, uh, more closely to uh, a, fi a more finished product. I can start pulling uh, a few more reds out here. Sergeant would just be delicately pulling out a little bit of red in the nose and um, warm, warm it up, make this drawing look, look a little bit more human, but just go easy on your reds. Reds just will take over. Uh, I would also suggest getting up and, and stepping back and looking. Uh, it, if you're this close to your drawing all the time and you think it looks wonderful and then it, it, it looks wonderful until you step back, well, be stepping back. <laughs> what was that? Right, right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm probably uh, aware that this microphone, I don't know if it picked up her comment, but basically she, she just corroborated what I said, because sometimes you think that your, your drawing is amazing and wonderful until you step back, and she's like, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> That's so often the case, and I, it happens to me all the time. Um, another trick that I was telling my students here, okay, we live in a, this is the 21st century, so you got to use whatever tools uh, pretty much any tool is fair game. And what I often do um, is, in addition to using a, ah, if I can pick it up, here, here we go, a mirror. I use a mirror an awful lot. I use a mirror in my, uh, when I'm um, drawing and painting, because it's like stepping back, but a mirror 
as I'm looking at my the reflection of my drawing in the mirror, it will reveal any distortions right away, quicker than anything. And you'll go, oh, no, I need to fix that. Um, so, and we're still very loose that you can still make adjustments and I'm not completely married to any one thing. And there've been enough times that I've worked on a drawing or I've worked on a painting and it's just not working. And um, it's almost better to just sort of wipe it out and start again. Well, you can't really do that with a drawing. <laughs> it's easy to just get another sheet of paper and start again. Um, but with a painting, I've just taken a rag. It happened a few nights ago where I, I was uh, painting a face and I thought it was working out and then it just, I, I must not have gotten the mapping right. Again, by mapping I mean just uh, getting the placement of the features. There was just something I was not getting right. And then I, um, it, you know, it's almost better to just wipe it out and do it again because you think, it, you, sometimes you tell yourself, oh, I've worked on this already so much, and I, I hate to, I'd hate to, I liked this eye, but I didn't like this eye. And um, sometimes you just have to wipe out um, a significant portion of it, if not all of it, and just start again. Sargent was known to do this to the chagrin of some of his, his uh, clients. <laughs> Or he'd be working on a, a piece, and um, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think I read this in one of the books about him, is that he was working on a, a commission, and then he working on it for weeks and weeks and weeks, and he came back after like three weeks and just wiped it out and just, just did it. Uh, he just redid it, and he did it really fast, but it was right. It needed to happen. Sometimes you just can't fix what's broke so um okay again uh, here i've talked about umber um and i've talked about uh let's say you've done a mostly monochromatic drawing where you've just used like white and you used umber or you used white and you used black and all of a sudden you change your mind you want to add color I say proceed with caution or don't do it um, <laughs> because sometimes you change your mind as an afterthought and you decide you want to make something color that you didn't begin um, the process knowing that you were going to do that can cause all, it, it's uh, your you have to tread very carefully because it's sometimes really hard to do it unless you're super experienced about how to know how to make that work. Um, you're just going to end up with something either something too muddy or too gray and too dark and dingy. Um, and it's just, it's just going to be a source of frustration from beginning to end. So we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to avoid certain pitfalls. So I'm hopefully giving you at least some ways to, and tips to bypass a lot of technical problems that can come up. Now, I'm, again, I'm not saying this is, this is how you should paint. You shouldn't paint exactly like me. I'm not saying that you should paint like exactly like me. That's not really the point of this class. The point of this class is to just get you to, let's remove a few obstacles. Let's remove um, a few technical issues that are so common to, to some. You'd, you'd be surprised how common these problems are. Um, and then that way, when you, when you hit the ground running, then things start to happen. The magic starts to happen. And um, I got a question about how you can, how do you, how do you uh, define your own personal style? How do you get to that point? Well, I can say that it's probably not going to happen in a three-day workshop, but <laughs> I can maybe give you a little bit of guidelines as to how to, to alleviate certain technical problems so that you can improve your draftsmanship and so that you can then find your own personal, personal style, you can, your own personal signature um, and and that your the ultimate goal for an artist is to get in that zone 
is to get in the zone, <laughs> that creative zone where things just happen and that you're just kind of, <laughs> I know it sounds cheesy, but you kind of get one with a medium, you know, but that's really true. That's what happens. Things work for you and this, that you, um, this medium is working for you. Um, that's what we want to have happen. Now I'm starting to pull out a little bit of warm, uh, I'm, I'm, I've held back on my on my reds, even though we we threw a pink lighting gel on her. What I mean by a pink lighting gel is that we put these colored uh, filters um, that you put over your lights, um, kind of like theatrical lighting, and so y it, you can sort of change the mood of your of your drawing and your painting. Simply by changing the color of your lights. And I do that an awful lot in my paintings. Um, the fun thing now that I'm, I'm starting to get into the hair, the hair is captured some some cool lighting that's kind of reflecting off of the back of her her hair back here and again you see I, I told you I, I was true to my word I haven't drawn her eyeballs yet have I <laughs> um, a word of caution at this point um, some people like to leave the whites of the eye white and think that that's literal, that the white of the eye is white. It's uh, uh, when you squint and you look at, I'm going to tell my students right now, squint and look at, at Michaela, uh, are the whites of her eye really, really white, white? Is it the whitest thing on your, uh, of, of, is that the whitest thing that you're seeing popping? Um, really, her eyes are kind of in shadow. And, but she has highlights that are reflected off of her eyeballs. Those might be lighter, but again, they might not be white, white, but maybe close, close to it. Um, um, so I've kind of left it sort of, uh, I've left her, her eyeballs sort of blank um, because, um, again, when I say everything needs to sit in the right universe, this kind of helps it so that the eyes aren't so jarringly white or the whites of the eye. They're just not going to, she's, she's not going to look like she's possessed or a zombie or something um, when all is said and done. But it's going to, it's going to sit, the color is going to be the right match for everything else that's going on here. So I'm kind of, I've held that in reserve. And right now I'm, I'm going to start picking out. A few more darks. Okay. What I'm grabbing right now is a little bit. Okay, I'm, I'm doing this with caution. Once you start introducing a darker color, you're gonna have to start adjusting everything. So be really, really careful, because it can just take over, and you're gonna be like, "Oh, I thought I got the contrast correct." When we start introducing an even darker, then um, it can throw the whole feel of your piece. So I am being very cautious, very, very cautious. And therefore, you can tone it down by blending it with another color. Right here, believe it or not, this is a kind of an olive green, but it, it somehow works on her on her blondish hair. Is all about color relationships and colors in relation to each other. So even though you pick up something green and then you put it down on your canvas, um, it might not look green next to another color. So a painting is all about color relationships.
and making sure that everything relates to each other. Again, you can kind of blend, you can kind of pull out some warm areas. And I kind of distributed amongst the class, I had some color wheels. And so um, I'm only talking about color in, um, with regard to complement, complementary colors. Um, because what I've, here, what I've done here is you can see that I've used, like I said, like uh, this sort of greenish, <laughs> what really is sort of an olive green. Um, I mean, I'll hold it up. So this is an olive green. This is sort of this olive green color. Um, oh, my goodness, I'm falling apart. My headset is kind of doing something funny. Okay. But it's in my eyes. Um, now, often what you want to do with a color to sort of tone down its greenness is I'm going to introduce its complement. And so I passed out a, 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 some color wheels to the students so that if they pick a color and they're finding like, oh my gosh, that, that blue is just sort of, sort of too much, or that green is too much, then um, one thing you kind of want to do is uh, something that might help is that you want to maybe introduce or maybe blend in its complement. And... Um, so this green, I'm going to kind of pick sort of this purpley reddish color um, into the shadows. And then it totally changes this green to, oh, okay, I get it. She's really blonde. I'm getting it now. It's all about color relationships. All right. I'm going to add a little bit more warmth up top. Oh, probably about the right color here. There we go. If you're just jumping in to this workshop, if you're, um, if you just joined us on on the internet, um, in this workshop today, what I'm doing a demo of is uh, I'm doing a pastel drawing and an oil painting demo. Um, I'll be doing I'll be doing the oil painting demo in just um, a, a little bit. Uh, not too long from now, I'd say in probably about 20 minutes, 15, 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to start the oil painting demo um, because I'm, I'm showing the relationship of drawing and, and painting and how to maintain some of your drawing quality in your painting and how to demystify oil painting if you approach it like a drawing. Um, and so the 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 great bridge between drawing an oil painting or acrylic painting is pastel. Uh, I'm using a chalk pastel. I'm using new pastels right now. And we've been going at this, uh, this portrait now for about 45 minutes. And so we're in a pretty good place. I feel pretty good. It's, it's feeling loose. It's not feeling like um, forced. It's, uh, it feels, it, it's feeling pretty good. Um, the object, I th we hope, or at least I hope, of this workshop is um, that I think students have come to me to try and loosen up. And that's kind of a good, um, uh, 
that's a, a good purpose for this this demo um, is to show really how you can be very direct and you can just you don't have to do like um, a a meticulous underpainting um, to really just jump in and really come up with a, a beautiful uh, product that's that's accurate and um, in terms of likeness it's finished it feels finished enough I, I think a lot of artists uh, do a meticulous underpainting um, there are plenty of my colleagues who do that out there and that's great I, I there's some really super fabulous artists who do that I'm just uh, for me I'm just really an, an, an impatient type of person <laughs> and I just want to get to it I, I um, I know plenty of artists who do really are meticulous and they do beautiful, uh, beautiful work. But you sort of have to find what works for you. And this sort of works with the way that I approach things. I think one of my earliest inspirations uh, was Edgar Degas. It was a revelation to me when I saw an exhibition of his when I was age 17 and I saw uh, at the National Gallery of Art in Washington DC they had um, okay so this was back in the 80s uh, they had a an exhibition of his drawings and his paintings and he did multiple um, versions of the same painting and multiple versions of the same drawing and it was a revelation to me of, of the process and I was so attracted to that, but uh, more importantly, I was attracted to um, how amazingly accurate he was. He had used such an economy of line. He just was effortless. And I aspired to be that way. I aspired that totally affected my approach. Um, so that's often what happens is that um, artists today, great artists today, they recognize that they have this heritage of artists that have gone before them. And you can sort of grab inspiration and, and this and that from the artists that have gone before you. And you pick and choose the things that you just gravitate toward, whether it's their approach, their use of color, their brush stroke. Um, it's, uh, you know, whatever appeals to you. And then you kind of inculcate that and then you're able to somehow use that not necessarily copy it because that's not what I'm saying at all um, artists take what they've used before they've inherited and then they retranslate it into something all their own and that's kind of the goal of all artists and I don't know if that can happen in a three-day workshop but hopefully um, once you start understanding that that's part of the process is that's pr maybe half the battle maybe you just need to find find those artists that really that really speak to you um, and and you can learn so much from them you can learn so much from going to a museum and and studying uh, a certain artist brush strokes or how he painted hands or how he pro approached flesh tone you can just learn so much um, and so anyway I just told you a little bit about sort of the artists that have that have inspired me other artists that have inspired me are um, Wayne Thiebaud um, he is a contemporary artist he's still alive in California and um, fabulous um, artist with um, um, use of color is just amazing and crazy cool um, and my mic is doing something funny again sorry if I have to readjust there we go uh, of course I mentioned Sargent another great influence uh, we also have NCY a fabulous illustrator all these guys were just killer that human figure they were effortless and their brush strokes were just fantastic there's Dean Cornwell 
Um, there's just uh, so many artists. Okay. Now, I think I might be ready to approach the eyeballs because I think I want to get going on this oil painting. So I'm going to draw this one to conclusion. And usually when I'm ready to do that, um, that's when I'm kind of ready to go for the eyes. I'm ready to, to pull them out. Uh, word of caution, again, I think um, when it comes to eyes, um, I think people are going to reach for black <laughs> to do her eyelashes. Now, Kayla has really lovely eyelashes, but if you squint her your eye, her eyelashes aren't going to be like the blackest black that's going to be on your in your box of pastels. So, and then, again, I don't have any black on here, and so it's going to jump out too much. It's just going to be too much. It's going to, again, be this foreign element on, on my drawing. So I'm going to um, pull from what I've used already. With caution, I have pulled like an indigo blue. Um, and an indigo blue is, um, it's going to appear like a cool black. And, um, but I'm going to be really cautious and really careful, and I'm just going to barely touch. But um, what's going to be my guide? I'm not going to be formulaic about this because I'm, I'm going to say don't do as I do in every case, but do what you see. Draw what you see and, and um, it, you know, don't reach for the same thing. It's every, every time we, we light a model, it might be different. And so the way the light reflects off of her lashes might be different. So um, anyway, I, but I will, however, tell you, give you some guidelines about being careful with color, being careful about introducing something too late in the game, and, it, and because you haven't used it anywhere else, it can throw your whole painting. Or it can throw your whole drawing. And so you have to be really cautious about that. And so if you're going to introduce a color, do it early enough on that you're able to sort of make a jive with the rest of your drawing. So I am just being, you know, I'm just barely touching it here and there, just pulling out areas of contrast. And I'm, I have a tendency to squint at my model with, <clears throat> I usually close my right eye and then I blur her. I'm doing, I do that unconsciously. I do it all the time. So if I look at, um, if I look like I'm mad or angry, it's not, it's not that I'm mad or angry. It's just because I'm squinting. And I'm not, I'm really not giving Michaela the stink eye. So um, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm blurring her because that, blurring her, it puts her out of focus. And it informs me of what color choices I should make and, and, the, and how dark, what the value is going to be of that color choice and how exactly to adjust it. And I'm, I've decided to use this indigo blue sort of as my darkest dark. But I'm, again, I'm proceeding with caution because blue, when you introduce blue, it's like black. It can just make everything, it can take over, and you have to just be careful. Um, you just kind of have to do it, and uh, you got to have, an, you can just do an, enough of it to bring out your darkest darks. Okay. Um, now, a word about eyes and the shape of the eye. If you're, the eye is kind of a complex thing in that it's a, it's a sphere and it's a wet sphere and it's in within the socket which has lids and the lids move the um, like not only does her upper lid move her their lower lid and so um it will it is um it's mobile and it's facile and it changes depending on where she's looking 
And, um, and so capturing the way her eye looks to, for me, she, her, eye is, her eye is looking toward my left, and um, her eyes are. And And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to capture that shape of the eye and, indica and, and sort of the choices of where I put my highlights and everything indicate, will indicate that it's a sphere. And right now I have, um, again, I haven't done the eyeballs, but I've kind of done the glint that's coming off of her eyes and then I'm going to put in, okay, now this is kind of tricky because I could take a, a knife and, and sort of shave down, which is what I think I might do. I think I might shave down this to a point a little bit. So I'm going to shave my... Prismacolor New Pastel to a little bit more of a point because you can't really get hyper detail with these fat sticks. Okay, sort of a point. I don't want to shave off too much, but I want to get up enough point where I can just get in here. Okay, first of all, I think I'm going to smudge my drawing because you can probably see my hands, they're just completely covered. And the, I re often rest my hand <laughs> on my pastel drawing. So I'm going to use, this is called a mall stick, great tool. And I use it in oil painting, and I use it where I don't want to rest my hand on my drawing or my painting, and I need something to steady it when I get in tight on something as precise as getting or doing her eye. And it's coming together. It may look a little weird for just a, um, until the eye is complete. This actually is a great time to introduce your pastel pencils if you have them. Your pastel pencils are awesome for pulling out detail when you want it. I would not suggest, I would not recommend, I should say, I would not recommend using a pastel pencils for your entire piece because you'd be there, you'd be at it a very, very long time. <laughs> and you, it might, you might end up getting tighter than you want to get if you didn't, if that's not what you're going for. If that's what you're going for, then that's fine. But if you're really not wanting to get uber tight, um, I would not recommend doing an entire drawing unless it's super small with um, pastel pencils. Sorry, I'm adjusting my mic. That's why I'm moving around. Sorry. It's kind of falling off the back of my head. I think it's made for a bigger person. <laughs> so I'm a really short person. I'm only five feet tall. And I think I, I, I like a really small hat size, so I can tell this is really made for a bigger person. But that's okay. We'll go with it. All right. Now, mall stick, that's where I was. Okay, I'm readjusting back. So, I mean, we are kind of nearing the completion of this study, at least, of Michaela. Um, it's n I'm not going to treat this as a finished piece, because I was. this is really a demonstration on how to to approach a pastel painting and then we're in just a few minutes like I said if you're just joining us I, I'm doing this pastel demo um, and then we're gonna jump right into oil painting because this is the great bridge between uh, pastel drawing or pastel painting is the perfect bridge between painting and drawing And I hope to some degree we've sort of demystified it. And, and um, 
in the sense that I know that uh, some people just don't even know where to begin with color. Now, do you see what I just did here? I just made something that's a little bit too warm, but I could go in and warm that up. I just, her eyebrow to me is just a little too warm, uh, sorry, too cool. I didn't mean warm, I meant cool. With that indigo blue, the beauty of pastels, you can kind of go in and take another color, blend it, tone it down. Um, so we, like I said, we're nearing completion of this. We're getting super close and I think we are almost ready here. So um, I had mentioned that we live in this 21st century, use whatever tool you can um, that is at your disposal. And I often tell my students, take an, uh, take an iPhone shot or whatever a cell phone you have, take a snapshot of your work and then look at it. It's, it's like stepping back or it's like using a mirror where you're sort of checking out your work to see if, hey, is this working? Is this, uh, what do I need to adjust? And when it re reduces it to the size of a thumbnail, um, your distortions are revealed or sometimes you may think, oh, this looks amazing. And then you take a snapshot of it and like, oh, okay, I need to put a little bit more contrast here or a little bit more contrast there. So, um, I feel pretty good about this and I think that I'm going to leave this right now. I'm going to, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange a bit and now I'm going to um, go into oil painting, but, um, I didn't spend time doing her, her outfit, but we just spent an hour doing, uh, yeah, it's just a little over an hour, just like um, 63 minutes doing this demo. And I was talking the whole time. So I hope you aren't sick of the sound of my voice. But now we're gonna move on to oil painting. And um, so just give us a second and we're gonna sort of adjust we're going to readjust things. So I'm going to move this. I'm going to slide this guy. I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move. I'm okay. I was telling you that I, oh, that would be awesome. Okay. This is probably a good time to do it. So bear with us a second. You guys can take a break. Michaela, I think we've gone for an hour. So why don't you take a five minute break? And guys, remember where she is, okay? So um, when she comes back, we can you can tell her if she needs to readjust so that it's going to be where you left off, okay? So we're going to take five, and we're going to fix the mic. All right. Here we go. There goes the thing. All right. Is that the better or do you want smaller? 
No, it's actually, it's good. It's good. That feels tons more snug. Okay. Thank you. How's it going? Is it, are you pulled in pretty tight? All right, to the, the demo part? You being going in and out? Oh, good. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Maybe I better follow the directions this time <laughs> on these commands. I thought this was a good idea, but I apparently am challenged at doing this. Okay, the red side. I did that right. Okay. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Awesome. Are you able to get the palette? Are you in? Is it is it in right now? What about this? Could you see? Am I blocking or are we okay? Kind of blocking. Do you want me to move it over? I'll just look the. Uh, uh, okay, actually, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to move this. I'm blocking my palette. Okay, I'll move the palette slightly. I'll move it out slightly. Or do you want to move the camera on that to that angle? Or is that not good? Probably not at this point. You've, you're taped down. Okay. All right. Okay, got my drink. Are we okay? Oh, yay. <laughs> yes. Yes. I just, um, yeah, I, what I did is I kind of, um, I kind of just put them in. I held them in reserve for later because I felt like if I, if I needed to warm it up, sometimes all I needed to do is warm up along the edge and then it somehow changed the whole color relationship and warmed up that whole area without really doing the whole area so um, sometimes that's all you need to do is sort of touch it you just got to hold your reds in reserve um, and they'll sort of do the job because red is you know it just will pop it will pop yes yeah I think so yes is that okay Great. Okay. Okay.
folds on, on her um, the clothing or whatever, um, by all means do that. I say use technology. There are a lot of artists who will not use photography. And um, uh, I, I use photography, but I'm not a photo realist. I use it to sort of inform my process. And I use it, um, I don't use it as my crutch per se, I use it to, as a Now, um, if you're following all of the, the steps that I had said that might help you with getting proportion, such as um, make sure that you're not moving your head and that you're flicking your eye back and forth. You know, there's so many, uh, it's so easy to flip, to, to resort to, you know, old habits if we're used to just looking in our, if we're looking more at our drawing and our painting more than we are at the model, that that can happen then some distortions can happen now all along the way i was sort of nudging this nudging 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 making adjustments that's what you kind of have to do there's going to be some things that i'm going to have to fix as i'm going so fix them as you're going you'll get you can talk you can talk it's all right all right yeah that's great fantastic okay so um we're kind of moving on to our next segment in this um, demo. I just did a, a demo right here, um, an oil pass, uh, oh, sorry, uh, a chalk pastel uh, or, or Prismacolor new pastel uh, painting or drawing. You, some people call these drawings paintings because you actually approach pastels similarly to, an, to a painting. And we're doing oil painting. We're not doing acrylic. We're doing oil painting today. And I am, am, am um, showing the relationship of drawing to painting and the approach and how it's very similar. And, and so, okay, what I've done here, you notice that I've used this, uh, I've used color. I love color. I like starting on color. That's sort of my thing. But you're, of course, you don't have to start on a color background. You can start on. Um, but I would, however, recommend um, either starting on a tinted canvas or or paper that is not white. Um, preferably a, um, a a canvas or a um, a paper that's sort of a medium value maybe not too light I use caution saying you know don't go too light even though it's colored if you go too light sometimes your colors won't pop enough your highlights might not pop enough and so you can see like this was a pretty good color choice in in terms of making your your colors pop making your highlights pop um, and so what I've done here is that um, Chloe thank you Chloe for she um, I had her I asked her if she could um, um, tint my canvas, and then I, what I what I did is I <laughs> I had bought this acrylic paint. I love to use I can use, I use sometimes whatever is in the house. Like I've got latex house latex paint, and I've got spare cans of it, and uh, I probably have more cans than I I should admit. I should be embarrassed to admit how much I have in terms of latex paint. <laughs> but um, I've got these cans of latex paint, and I use them sometimes. Um, I can't attest to their ar archival um, quality, but um, they're, they make great underpainting, and I end up invariably painting over all of it. So hopefully it's not going to fade at the rate, you know, sometimes latex paint fades. It will fade, like if you ever paint your house and then you have to like fix a ding in your wall a few years later but find it doesn't match because it's faded well. Um, so I at least try and um, um, paint over most of the surface area but it's a great starting place for me because I just like to knock out that white. 
Now, um, uh, there are artists who like to work wet on wet with their oil. What I mean by wet on wet is that they uh, use a, that they'll take um, either, um, they'll, they'll dilute their oil paint with either thinner or oil painting medium. Um, and then they, they just, just take a, and make sort of a, they take their like umber color, their raw umber or their burnt umber, and then they'll rub it into their canvas. And I personally don't like using wet on wet. That's a personal preference. Some people just love doing it. And it, I, for me, um, I don't like to do it because I, whatever color I grab, I want it to be the exact same color that I put down. And, uh, and if I'm picking up some, some color underneath that's making it muddy, it frustrates me. So um, this approach, it works for me. And so um, now the approach that I'm doing is a very direct approach. I do very minimal underpainting. And what I mean by underpainting is just, it's the drawing that I'm going to do in oil paint underneath. I don't really spend a ton of time doing it. There are lots of artists who will draw on their canvas. They'll either draw in charcoal or they'll draw in, um, maybe it's a waxy china marker. Sometimes they'll use a, um, a graphite and then they'll have to seal it so it doesn't muddy up their colors or lose charcoal or something. And um, I, I'm, I'm a very impatient person. And, and so I kind of like to bypass bypass that step altogether. Um, I like drawing. I love drawing, but I kind of want to just get to it. And this is a very direct approach. And so if you, um, a lot of students uh, uh, come to me when they want to loosen up, they want to not uh, get too tight. Don't get too tight too fast. Okay. Um, if you really want to have a loose painting, if you're getting tight too early, you're going to you're going to have a tight painting and then you're going to be like, oh, it's a point of no return. And so you want to avoid that. Okay. So I'm going to just maybe uh, suggest an approach here that I, that I'm doing. I'm not saying paint like me. I'm just perhaps showing you some things where I, you can bypass certain um, steps that might actually be unnecessary and that actually might hinder you. Yes. Go ahead, Navi. A color? Add highlights? Sorry. At what point do you decide? I do start out loose. I'm, I'm sorry, Navi. I'm going to end up repeating your question so that the people who are watching, they won't be able to hear you, so I'm going to repeat your question. So go ahead. At what point do you start do you start to draw tightly? I kind of try and hold back as long as possible. Um, did you see how like on this drawing, I really held back on the eyes. I that's almost like the last thing I do. Um, and and that prevents me sometimes if you do the eyes first, you get really tight and then then you when you start to introduce the hair and you're like going, Oh, wait a minute. I thought my eyelashes were dark enough or I made the hair too dark and so it throws off the way the eyes look and, and, and um, so we can throw things if you do things too tight, too quickly and too myopically. So consider the whole first, consider the whole, stay, stay as loose. Now um, when I say loose, I mean, I mean not married to those exact lines. If you need to adjust them later, which invariably is going to happen, you have to make allowances for that and not to be so like loath to make those adjustments if they really need to happen. Does that make sense? Um, so, okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. All right. So I started out with this tinted canvas and it's dry. I'm not going to do wet on wet. Uh, what I have here, I should probably tell you a little bit about um, the colors that I have on, on, on my palette. Now, I probably am not going to use every color here, but this is sort of my, these are sort of my, my um, paints that I put out just in case I, I do want them. But, um, but for those of you who are 
um, using the paints that I provided, I think the ones that we have included are um, either titanium white or I actually have permalable white. The difference between the whites are very, some are more cool, some are more warm, some of them have a linseed oil content, which is going to be your binder for all, for most oil paints, it's going to be something like linseed oil. Um, you, it's ground pigment in linseed oil or it's in poppy seed oil and they have different drying times. And the reason why I, even though I have titanium white here, that's linseed oil, but permalable white, it uses it, I forget actually, I'd have to go read the label of what, I don't know if it's safflower oil, I'd have to check. I don't want to tell you something wrong, but um, it doesn't yellow as, as, as much. So if you're looking for a white that won't yellow, yellow over time, a good choice is Weber Permalba White. And so that's, that's on the table. We have Alizarin Crimson, which is, oh my goodness, it's sort of running into my other color. I went vertical <laughs> with my palette here. Can you see? Is it on camera okay? Okay. So I have this Alizarin Crimson, which is a nice go-to color for flesh tones. Um, and then you would probably mix that as we talked about earlier we talked about flesh tone with pastel it's gonna some of the s same principles apply here that's a kind of the reason why i did both drawing and um painting actually what i should probably do um can i ask you to just put these up here with these magnets kind of on on the other side um i'll put this up here and um so that um, I, I can always refer to it, and I don't have to keep holding it. Okay, so you want to just grab these. Yeah, just yeah, just grab those. Thank you so much, Sam. Okay. I'm going to slide this over just a teeny bit so he has some room. Do you have enough room? Okay. All right. We have, a, uh, I said, alizarin crimson. We have titanium white. We have burnt umber. Um, we have, I think I got Prussian blue for you guys. That's a really nice blue. Um, and I got Naples yellow and which is right here. There's a yellow ochre right here. And there is, um, there's a few other colors. I might've, uh, included a violet color here, but the, um, the rest of the colors are kind of like icing and, um, but those are kind of some of your essential colors. I think I did cadmium yellow. It's probably a medium cadmium yellow on there. That is your classic oil palette right there. And you can do so much with just those colors alone. And all, like I said, all these other ones that I kind of love, I'm, I love turquoise. <laughs> You'll see a lot of turquoise in my paintings. And I have an awesome uh, turquoise here is cobalt cobalt teal by uh sorry gamblin gamblin it makes that color and there's certain colors that i like by certain manufacturers that everybody universally just loves this cobalt teal it's sort of just this happy color it's awesome um and i've sort of also included here this other color that i've discovered is kind of this it's a misty blue, and I'm trying to see if I can't find who makes it. Um, here it is. Um, it's by, I think it's Hol Holbein. Holbein makes this misty blue, which I find it's sometimes hard to get a really nice, like, icy blue color that um, does what I want. And then another thing that I love to use, okay, is I'm going to uh, show you a lot of this. Sometimes this is a uh, this is completely new to people that they've never used them before, but I absolutely adore um, RNF pigment sticks. And out of all of the oil, you'll see oil bars out there. Basically, it's like oil paint on a stick. And I love this color oh uh, it, i use it so much in my painting when i'm when i'm using some cool lights yes i have a question go ahead okay this is cerulean extra pale blue 
and it's made by RF pigment sticks, uh, pig, RF pigments, and it's pigment sticks, which is considered an I don't know why, because that sounds waxier, but it's really buttery. It's like lipstick. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, and there are other oil bars out there I've tried. They're just too waxy, and they don't really have the same consistency. So this is my choice when I go to, to use it. Another color that I love to use, crazy as it is, I love dianthus pink. Uh, I just think it's 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 just awesome because I can do some really cool things with flesh tone, and I'll show you in a minute too what I'm what I'm talking about and how I use them. You're like, how in the heck am I going to use them? I also use um, John Jean Brilliant or John. Uh, it's spelled yeah, it's, uh, it's like brilliant yellow. You can see uh, it's well used, and they kind of get this film on there, so I'm going to have to like. Um, take a rag and wipe off the um, they get really messy I should have brought my gloves but they get really they're just gonna get everywhere because they're just so it's like painting with a stick of butter but they're awesome I love them I love them and you'll see how I'm gonna use them another color that I like to use with the um, RF pigment sticks is extra pale yellow and <laughs> I've used it tons. It's now a, just a teeny stub right here. So, okay. So like my drawing that I did earlier today, that probably was just an, that was an hour long study. Um, and I'm going to do the same setup so you can see the relationship um, and the approach and how similar it is. It's, uh, I'm approaching it like drawing. And so, okay, um, just a word about brushes and what I'm grabbing, um, because sometimes grabbing the wrong brush can just make or break what you're trying to do. Um, you've got to pick the right brush for, uh, to do the right job. And um, right now, um, so, uh, you know, early on, I, I like to pick these these round brushes. I used to avoid rounds until I watched Steve Houston paint. If you're not familiar with Steve Houston, it's spelled H-U-S-T-O-N. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he uses rounds. And pretty sure he uses filberts, too. They're different shape brushes. And um, a filbert um, is... I'll show you the shape of the filbert. This is a filbert right here. It's not quite a flat, but it kind of has this round top like this, but it's really, it's actually sort of flat, but it's tapered. Um, I, I love angled brushes. I love angled brushes. I can get great edges. I can get, I can get a nice, clean edge, and I can get detail with an angled brush. Um, and then, and these are also fairly stiff to um, medium stiff because when you're using, when you're doing oil paints, you got to have a brush that isn't a wimpy brush that's not going to push your paint around. So, you know, sable is only good because it's so soft if you're doing detail and you've thinned quite a bit with your thinner. So, um, but these are, I, I'm, I'm pretty much a direct painter that I don't really use, um, like, your very soft brushes unless I'm, like, barely taking these brushes that are pretty stiff. So we're talking about, like, a hog's, um, like a synthetic hog or synthetic mongoose, or these, um, Catalyst makes these poly tip brushes, which I really, really like. Okay, so right now, I am going to go ahead, I have just thinner, I'm not using oil medium for this demo. The purpose of oil medium, because it can be a mystery, it's, it can be a mystery, or it's just totally new to people, oil painting, is that, um, you don't really, you don't want to break down your pigment so much with thinner that it's so, it's just going to be runny and then it's, 
it's not going to bind to your surface. But I, um, I don't thin my, my paint so much. I either use it straight, straight up, or I use a very, very little thinner. Um, yes, go ahead, Carrie. When do you use a dryer? If you're, I don't ever need to use dryer because the the interesting thing is I don't actually paint super thick. So there might be parts that are a little bit thick, but I, I kind of an impatient painter. I just kind of want to get it done, and it's not like that thick applications of paint. Um, there might be some texture in there, but um, you, uh, I don't use dryer. I. The reason why I, I use, I say, uh, you know, when using medium, use medium with caution. Because I, I used to use medium, but it used to be so distracting the different, like you'd get some really glossy spots or really, um, you know, you get shiny spots and then you get some that aren't shiny. And that's very distracting. So, um, you can get mediums. There are a few. Um, I think Grumbacher might make a, a matte medium. There are some out there that are more matte that you won't have that. But I also don't want, I don't like to use a medium with Damar varnish. Your classic oil medium is going to have linseed oil in it. It's going to have a, a thinner like turpentine. And, it, and then it's going to have, if I, I'm, I'm probably saying Damar wrong. Um, I've heard it pronounced so many different ways, but I'm just going to say Damar, um, Damar varnish. Um, Damar um, will add to the gloss, but it tends to yellow over time. And I don't really like it, and it's shiny, and, it, and, and it's a distraction to me personally as a painter. And I have never been able to master that formulation, so I just make it more simple. L tons of painters are out there, and they just use it direct. You don't have to use a medium, but if you're really trying, a, a medium is, is good if you're actually doing more glazing techniques, probably, you know, so that you could have a transparent quality to them. Um, but I, I don't add anything. The reason why I'm only using thinner, um, I use it sparingly um, and just sufficiently enough, but I use it very, uh, I'm just doing a very direct painting. And the thinner also accelerates the drawing. I don't feel like I have to add a drying accelerator, but transporting this home can be a trick for people. But I find that if you're going to go and visit your painting again and come and do another pass at it in a couple of days and use dryer on it, you've used dryer on it later in the day, it really bothers me when it gets tacky. The dryer will make the paint tacky, and then that ends up being, then I'm starting to fight with the consistency of the paint, and I don't like to do that. So I... That's just my my approach to mediums. Um, I uh, my, like I said, my painting is pretty direct. This approach is pretty direct. So what you're going to see is going to be a finished painting. We're going to be done here in two hours or um, uh, two and a half, two and a half hours. And um, no, sorry, one and a half hours. Am I correct? Okay, so I think we can do it. So I grabbed my angle brush. Now we're beginning at last. Okay. I said be careful about getting too much thinner. I grabbed a little bit too much because it's going to just totally run down my, my palette here. Um, just to let you know, this is a great, uh, if you, you just want a um, palette paper, um, this is Gray Matters. It's a nice um, neutral color instead of just using white. Um, and then you get a better, um, I don't know, it just makes your colors pop right there. Um, I, I just really like using those. My friend Jonathan Linton introduced me to those, uh, to gray matters. Okay, so um, I have already done something that I didn't want to do. I think I'm going to move it over. Now, We I just jumped right in without giving that preamble again we uh, we talked about co composition with our drawing when we moved her and so i'm going to actually do a similar composition because this is the exact same setup and a lot of these students here that um they are just doing the same painting that they began earlier but um unlike myself which I, and i'm just beginning a whole new demo okay so what i grabbed here 
is, again, this umber color. Is, I should ask the students, okay, is she looking in the right place? Is it, is it this exact same setup? When you work with models and we take breaks, um, it's, I always uh, ask the students to pipe in so that they, they get the model to return to the exact same position that they were at because it will be a source of frustration later. If, they're, if uh, you're too timid to pipe up <laughs> um, because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings about, um, oh, well, she needs to move a millimeter to the left or whatever. Um, and it can, it can totally make a difference on your painting, and then it can also wreck your painting if you decide to change it part way and change the point of view. So, um, again, if you're just joining us and you didn't see the earlier demo, um, basically what I'm doing right now is I am mapping, and I'm tr gonna stay really loose and some of the key to likeness, uh, and this is for Carrie Brotherson who asked me this earlier, um, as something to address is like, how do you really capture likeness? And some of the um, tips that I'm gonna give will sort of help um, solve some technical problems that you might have. Um, and one of which is that if you'll notice in my, we've spent a lot of time setting up. And in that setting up, I have made sure that my, the only thing that really is moving back and forth in my eyes, my head's not really moving. I'm in a good spot when I'm pretty comfortable. I'm really comfortable. Um, and I am looking at, at my canvas, the only time you see me turn is if I'm like turning towards my palette. And um, I'm kind of set up a, um, a ways so that um, just sort of to accommodate this whole video setup. So um, it, I'm kind of having to turn um, a little bit. But my palette is right here and my, my solvents are right here. So. But by and large, that's really the only turning that I'm doing. But other than that, I am, my eyes are, are going to be mostly on the model and not nearly as much on my canvas. My eyes are flicking back and forth. Okay. Sorry, did I say that backwards? My eyes, yeah, your eyes should really be on the model. <laughs> I did say it right. And stay loose, stay loose early on, because guess what? You will have to make adjustments. Even I have to make adjustments later on. That's why if you stay loose, you're not married to the marks that you've made, that you're perfectly willing to make adjustments if you need to make adjustments. It's going to happen. Um, just embrace it. Don't be afraid to make marks. Uh, because you can paint over them. But I am staying really loose. I'm staying loose just like I did in my drawing. It's, I'm approaching this underpainting. Do you, see, do you guys see the similarity already in the approach? Actually, I'm going to switch to my round. I was using an angled brush because I love cutting in with my angled brush. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, sorry, I keep turning this way thinking I, my palette's right here. I'm not used to working <laughs> with uh, my palette being vertical. It's old habit. But I'm doing it vertical for the sake of this demo. So i am just got to get it into my head so I don't have to turn so much. I'm like, where's my palette? It should be right next to me, but really it's vertical. It's Um, staying loose, uh, round brushes also kind of help you stay kind of loose, um, if they're kind of a medium size. This one right here is a size four, um, and it comes to a nice point. This is a titanium brush. This is actually a very nice brush. It's a Robert Simmons, number four titanium. It's a, 
It's a very nice brush. And it's appropriate to, for this size canvas. This is an 18 by 24 canvas. You're, and not only do you pick the right brush for the right type of uh, job, but also the right size of, of canvas that you've got here. If you've got like a big canvas, you might have to pick bigger brushes um, to cover enough of the area. Um, you can't possibly comfortably paint with a teeny tiny brush, uh, at least well, I know I can't. <laughs> now, um, I paint with an, sort of this overhanded style. I hold it like a pencil. But I, I was watching a demo um, by Steve Houston, who is an amazing figure artist. And I noticed that he often holds his brush like this. And um, he's kind of doing this underhanded thing and, and does this. And he just, you can't help but stay loose. If you really want to not get tight, try switching how you hold your brush. And he does this um, very loose quality. You know, he has this really, really loose quality to his work that is just, but it's spot on. And it's, it's beautiful. So check him out. His, uh, you just you can Google him, uh, Steve Houston. It's H U S T O N. Um, and he does demos uh, online. Um, he there's newmastersacademy.org. You do have to pay, however, like there's an annual fee, or maybe it's per per demo, depending on if it's a, it's a if it's a live stream. Um, But you guys watching on the internet are kind of lucky because this one's free. All right, so um, constantly, ch I'm, I'm constantly checking. I'm flicking my eye back and forth. I know I'm going to need to make some adjustments. All right, let's see. I already see one. A rag is kind of um, handy. Uh, this is something that you can't do in pastel painting. You can't really rub out. You can actually take a little bit of thinner rub out something that you didn't like but it's really not going to uh, this early it's i don't really have to rub out because i can just paint over it, it you'll and you'll see that in a minute when i what i mean i'm just gonna i'm gonna hit some color hard and fast in a minute and i'm really not going to worry so much about values right then there that's probably the biggest difference between oil painting and um, oil and, and chalk pastel. I on on the chalk pastel. I ready. I did a little bit of underdrawing and I did a little bit of the value underneath so that a ghost of it would show through when I laid when I blocked in my flesh tone. Um, and to some degree, I can do that, but it's going to probably get sort of wiped out. I will, however, map out where the eyes go. I'm going to map out. Um, I'm going to map out where the features are, and that enough is going to be my guide. But I'm not, I'm right now, I'm really not going to stress about detail. But as long as I feel like I've got the bare bones in place, and I feel good about their placement, and I, I feel good about, um, see, I'm, I'm feeling like I can make some adjustments here. Um, I think the approach that I'm, I'm showing you, again, <laughs> there again, I did that habitual thing where I turned and I thought my palette was right next to me. Okay, palette's vertical. Palette's vertical. I got to keep telling myself that. Um, okay. I, um... I, I like to cover um, enough area fast so that, you know, you leave a enough of it loose so that, um, and you've got enough of it on your canvas so that if you need to pull back and just stop um, and keep and maintain a very loose quality, you're able to do that because you have enough of a painting indicated um, 
because I think that's really the hard part, is artists really don't know when to stop. It's like, oh no, I've, I've passed the point of no return and I've overworked it and I've killed it and I should have just stopped like three hours ago. Anybody ever have that feeling in this group? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of uh, um, artists who, I think that's, a, that's just a universal experience that um, you don't want to overwork a painting where you just lose the magic. And when it's looking forced, if it's looking contrived and, um, and you're fighting with something, then it's time to either step back. Um, and sometimes that means you need to like maybe put it away for a day or two and come back to it, um, maybe even longer. But if you leave it too long, I will say I've had many an unfinished painting that's in my studio that I've not, I have not gone back to. So uh, if you plan on, on finishing it, uh, it's probably not a good, time, a good thing to, 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 to let it sit for too long. Or just if you're just not going to get to it, then embrace that and just say, OK, I'm not going to get to it and just move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there's just some paintings that you just can't fix. And I've had that experience too. And sometimes you just, you have to have your share of, of those to know later on, okay, uh, I, I've learned from this experience and I learned not to do this and I've learned not to do that. Okay. All right. So what I'm, I, I'm kind of feeling, I'm feeling good about just Placement, and so now we are getting ready to address flesh tone. Now, um, as with uh, this, it's going to look really kind of crazy, so don't panic. <laughs> it's going to look crazy uh, for, uh, for a little bit because um, I should tell myself not to panic. I should be the one to panic. I'm the one who's on, <laughs> who's on camera. But if I make a, a really bad gaff, <laughs> but um, okay, I've grabbed here my oil bars, and this is where I use them. Um, so I've, I've, what I've done is I, uh, they, they tend to get a film on them, and I've kind of wiped the film off. So if you guys want to, if any of you who want to come around and watch this, I would say now's a good time to like move and just kind of watch. Um, Unless, of course, you want to just keep working and then watch the demo later on YouTube. But, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and this is where it's so similar to oil painting. Um, you can maybe come around. You might, it's okay if you cross in front of the camera for a sec. It's fine. So um, how many students do we have in here right now, Carrie? Where'd Carrie go? We have about 15 people in here. It's a really fun size. Um, group. We're in a great space. We're uh, here at SVU, if you didn't know that, and you're just joining us. We're at Southern Virginia University, and we're in the dance studio. It's a, an awesome space. High ceilings, wood floors, big windows, and we got we have actually a, a, a mirror over here. It's, it's just a neat place. Okay, so, all right, so I'm just going to See, I told you I was, I, this is why I'm not married to what I've drawn underneath. It basically is kind of a placeholder. I can see a ghost of it underneath where, where the eye was, but I, you know, I didn't like, it's not hurting my feelings if I, I'm going over it. Okay, you can see it's pretty, pretty rough, but you see, I just, I was able to cover a lot of surface area fast. <laughs> That's what you get when you're an impatient painter like myself. Um, you just need some, I just need to cover some surface area fast. There are some benefits to that. The reason why there's some benefits to using oil bars is that you can kind of homogenize your color. I, I would say one of the biggest problems in my, uh, my own experience um, here, what I'm using now is I'm just using a little bit of Mona Lisa thinner um, to, to sort of blend it. And I'm just sort of homogenizing um, the flesh tone, okay? Um, so 
oil bars. Oh yeah, they're awesome. <laughs> Look at that, just really fast, and it's really buttery. Um, it's, some of them take longer to dry than others. Okay, but it looks super flesh tone, it's super yellow. That's because it's brilliant yellow, but we have, she, we have this really rosy, yellowish lighting on, on Michaela right here. And I'm also knocking out what's underneath. Yeah, I have to be. You have to be really careful. I I went a little bit too dark or too dark than I had it, darker. Sorry, darker than I intended uh, on the um, the value of my the tint of the canvas. Um, but no, it's okay. I mean, it's still, in certain parts, it's okay. But it's kind of fun because some of it will peek through, and I can kind of leave it sort of unfinished and stuff, and um, it's still gonna work. So um, that's the nice thing about um, oil bars is that, again, you can cover a lot of area fast. And um, I will say that one of the problems that you might find some frustrations, and tell me if you've ever had this experience, if you have painted a human figure before, but you've gone and done the flesh color, and then you ran out of that color, you run out of the color and then you go to remix it and you can't quite get it the same. And then it's like, and then you start like having all these weird strokes because you're trying to fix it. And then things start to look tight and contrived. So this is sort of one way to sort of bypass that. Um, so I kind of block that in. Now the next uh, area that I want to block in is so I sort of want to um, do the hair. I kind of want to block in. Um, so here I am going to, here we go. Here we go. I'm grabbing my, my palette knife here. So I'm going to maybe mix some color, but now I, I would say that if consider the surface, the amount of area that you're going to be covering. So you want to mix enough of a color that you're not going to run out. So in other words, if you're going to be doing flesh tone and you want to, um, I'm I, this is just the base. This is going to be, it's going to be altered, but this is just a base right here. Um, trust me, she's not going to look so yellow when I'm done. Um, um, you want to mix enough of a pot of color so you don't have to keep remixing and reinventing uh, and remixing and reinventing. You want to mix enough of a color appropriate to your area that you're um, that you're going to work on. And so I'm kind of and it, there, this is not a precise science, okay? So I am just grabbing. That's probably a little bit more than I needed there. Um, you want to wipe before you dip your um, a fresh color. Um, I'm actually working on the color of her hair right now. And again, this is sort of an approximation. You could take your palette knife, you can hold it up to see if you like it. Okay. Um, some people swear by not mixing with their with their brushes, but I tend to do it <laughs> to, um, to some degree. Um, this is a nice medium value. Um, there's some darker spots that I'm going to end up pulling out. But ultimately, again, everything that you paint, is, it's going to be all be, a, it's going to be about color relationships. And I, I said this in the last drawing demo that, okay, the color, whatever colors you pick, they have to sit in the same universe. They have to be able to be, like, your red can't be some weird alien red that doesn't belong in your painting, um, unless it has a purpose. Your, um, every, every color sort of has to have a purpose. And when if um, we're trying to... Um, replicate color, I, um, a good rule of thumb 
when you're trying to decide, okay, um, I need to, okay, her hair is blonde, but I don't want to just grab yellow. Um, and then you have to decide, oh, okay, but it's being hit by a warm light. So you kind of have to sort of maybe do a little bit of experimentation, like, oh, I know that it's, it's not blonde blonde, but um, you, it's either going to be, okay, but her hair is maybe on this side, it's going to be cool. So it's so you might in, include a hint of blue in there. Go bear, proceed with caution. However, don't just grab a ton of blue. You um, especially Prussian blue, phthalo blue, um, cobalt blue. Any of those blues um, that you might have um, will just t t overtake. They will overtake things. So um, okay. So I'm just totally blocking in, staying really loose. If you've seen any of my um, demos, or sorry, uh, the progress of my paintings on Instagram, have you guys seen those? You can see the step of the, you, you, this is very similar to what, I, what you see on, on, like, on the process. I'll like post progress pictures and then the finished product. And um, this is very similar in approach sort of a demystifying. It's a very simple approach. It's a very direct approach. See, even though I've like painted over that eye that I drew in, it doesn't hurt my feelings because you know what? I'm okay. I'm okay with it because I can still find where that eye is. I can find that uh, where that eye is because I'm not moving around. I've, I've, I'm, I'm staying, again, fairly stationary, but I'm still relaxed. Um... And okay, this blue that um, I didn't actually get to, but we're probably probably going to be able to get to somewhat. Um, um, I'm going to mix a um, a blue now. Now the blue has a little bit of a a warm light on it. It's got this rosy light. We put a, a red. Uh, sorry, it's like a a pink lighting gel on our light. And so everything that you paint, and the reason why I, I, I put lighting gels, especially for the students, is so that they can totally understand that, um, and it forces you not to reach for just blue. You're going to need to mix it with something so it fits into this, into this warm, rosy universe that's on your canvas, that's going to be on your canvas. So, um, of course, this ro warm, uh, rosy universe is... Um, just with the figure so far. And um, let's not neglect some of the negative space here. So I, um, I'm i also going to start indicating maybe a little bit. I'm just going to grab some of this color right here, and I'm going to... just sort of to indicate that there's something behind... Like, she's got this blue. Damask chair that she's on. Now, in the amount of time that we have left, because we're going to go for one more hour, um, I'm, I'm not going to do a completely full painting of this. Um, for this demo, I will do as much as I can. I'll probably hone in on just um, part uh, part of it. If I'm gonna, if I am going to do a um, a painting of it later, if I want to come back and finish it, do a more finished version of it, I will take pictures of the setup. So. Um, all right. So. Now this blue, like I said, this blue right here needs to fit in the right universe. So I'm going to mix. I'm going to grab, oh, I thought I put some cer uh, cerulean blue on there, but I don't have a, the, the tube cerulean blue. 
but well, I'm going to approximate. I'm going to use a bit of this Prussian blue. I'm going to use some white. Again, don't forget to wipe <laughs> in between. Um, if you're just going to muddy up your colors if you don't. And I know that I could be mixing a whole lot more. I, sat, I just told you that you need to mix enough paint up approximate to the surface area that you know you need to cover. So you, like I said, you got to mix enough, but I am not, for the sake of this demonstration, hold on, let me straighten out my palette a little bit here, which is held up by magnets. Um, that's very white. But we're going to add, we're going to add uh, more Prussian blue. Prussian blue is a warm blue. Um, I, so warmer, I should say, than ultramarine. It's warmer than um, cobalt. And what I see in front of me is a little bit more warm. And guess what we have here, too? It's also got this rosy lighting in it too. So I could do one of two things. I could rosy it up with some paints or I can maybe introduce that warmth with my oil bars and blend it in. And I'm going to show you, I'm actually going to do my oil bars. So I'm going to go ahead and just, um, I'm going to I was probably, the, um, you know, this is probably as thick as it gets. If you really wanted to do some thick effects, use your knife. And you can actually get some really nice knife effects and everything. Um... But I told you I was going to sort of, I want this to sit a little bit more in that, you know, it's, it's a darker blue, actually. So I'll probably just go in and um, I can blend that a little bit. But I'm going to go in here a little bit with my oil bars and just warm it up a little bit or so that it's, it starts to sit in the same universe. And then I'm going to take my brush and I'm going to blend it a little bit. But you'll have to wipe off your oil bars, too, if you do that. And then I'm going to grab a little bit more of this blue here. And I actually think it needs a little bit more of alizarin here. Now, alizarin crimson is kind of a a cool, a cooler red. Um, okay, we're staying really loose here because you. I've used a knife. Um, it's, it's, it's staying really loose and I'm okay with that. I'm actually thinking, Hey, I'm going with it. I like what's happening. Sometimes you, you'll find that, um, it's kind of like, Oh, I didn't exactly intend for it to be like that, but I think I like it and keep it. Okay, this is uber loose, and, but I'm going to kind of leave it for now because I'm, I can come back to it in a little bit. Um, I can darken this as I go. I think it needs to sort of, in some of the areas, it needs to, it has some shadows that are deeper or sort of this, the folds and everything.
So Carrie, I just told you that I don't use a thick application of paint, and in this case, I did, <laughs> but that's okay. You kind of just go with it, and um, some, some applications can be thicker at times than others, but um, just kind of going with it. Uh, and I'm just sort of letting things happen here with the paint. that were unintentional but kind of ended up being kind of cool. So I'm just going to, okay. So now on to the, okay, we have an hour. And so I, what I'm going to do is I am going to start um, going back and um, putting in some of her features. I'm still reaching for that umber because I'm going to go in and sort of define things. I'm using this angled brush. It's a number three angled brush, and it's an angle shader. Let's see who makes this. Master's Touch. This one is one that you just, it's a cheap brush that you get from Hobby Lobby. All my angled brushes are really cheap brushes that um, you can get anywhere. You can get at Michael's. I go through them like crazy. I'm really hard on them, but I like what you can do with them. I like the control. They're not necessarily meant for oil paints, but, um, th well, this, this one is. It's a, it's a synthetic hog brush, which means it's kind of a stiff bristle. And I love it because you can get really nice line with it, and it's, you get nice control. And I love it. I'm actually going to grab some of, uh, like, a little bit of this. I think I'm maybe going to grab... A cooler blue. There's a little bit of ultramarine. Put that in here so I can make this line in, in the back pop a little bit more. Now you'll notice that I don't use black for those of you who are or who, who kind of joined us a little bit late. I kind of talked a little bit earlier about I don't I don't actually use black. I, I make black by mixing colors. There's a way to do that. You can mix depending on if you want a warm black or a cool black. Um, I, I would mix my Prussian blue with alizarin crimson and sometimes viridian. If I had phthalo blue on here, I would mix it with phthalo, uh, um, and then I'd mix it with my, um, my raw umber. And you could get a nice, rich, dark color that's going to have enough contrast, black, I, I apologize if you've watched this whole thing, but um, chances are people's attention spans are, they probably only watch part of it and tune in to only part of this. So I, some of the things I may say are, might be redundant, but black tends to sort of just pop uh, too much. If you use it straight up, and even if you mix it into your, your colors, it just can take over and it makes things muddy and I, I don't, I don't use it, and it almost looks like I use black because look at that. Doesn't that look like black? <laughs> um, so anyway, what I'm doing here right now is I'm now ma mapping out her features. Okay. Okay. Um, and just going in and starting to define things. Um, I'm going to just spend only a very short amount of time just going back and remapping where her eye was, which I ended up painting over, as you remember, um, just so that I can give some placement. Um, I'm, and this raw umber that I'm using is kind of a nice... If there's any go-to color, it's not a bad choice. It's a pretty good go-to color for just mapping things out. Raw umber tends to blend very well. Sorry, raw, burnt umber. I kept saying raw umber, but really what I have is burnt umber. Um, burnt umber is warmer than raw umber. Raw umber is like a sort of an olivey brown, gray brown. Um, so if I say that, I apologize if I misled you. <laughs> there is enough of a difference for those who paint, but 
sorry, don't be up in arms if I said it wrong. I really meant the other. Um, it's a subtle difference. And one tends to have more contrast. I tend to use uh, um, burnt umber more just because it has a little bit more contrast in it um, than raw umber. Raw umber, like I said, is kind of more of a gray brown. Okay, so I'm going in and I'm, I'm doing some basic mapping again, just because um, I've blocked in that area. And then after this point, then I go st and start adding some values. Um, you know, even at this point, um, I did say that you're going to need to make adjustments. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen along the way. You're just going to, that's just the way things go. And if you're really looking for likeness, uh, one of my students, Navi, had asked, well, how do you, how do you, um, what was your question again about uh, mapping and did you, you had a question about proportion. Um, right, okay, so proportion, you're going to just need to make adjustments as you go. Um, it's just, that's the way. You just ever nudge it closer to to where you want it. Like I'm already seeing, oh, I'm flicking my eye back and forth, and I see that maybe this difference right here, I, I'm going to just n nudge it a little bit to, I, I see that her neck really comes in a little bit closer and that this right here is like here. And then I go in and I sort of end up fixing things. I mean, being careful of course you're going to be careful all the way through. You're going to be, um, hopefully you're making adjustments along the way so there's nothing too big and too drastic that you're going to, you're going to change up. Again, I like these RF pigments because they're, they're just nice and buttery. They will, some of them take forever to dry though. <laughs> like that pale yellow takes forever to dry. And probably not a great choice for a workshop that you're only doing in three days and you have to transport it uh, several hundred miles and you throw it in the back of your car. Um, <laughs> you just might end up getting it all over. Uh, you know, you might get pale, uh, extra pale yellow, that's the color. Extra pale yellow on everything. <laughs> it's not pretty. So, um, all right. So, um, we talked a little bit about um, complement, but we just barely touched on uh, colors and how they relate to each other. And, um, Sometimes, like this, her skin right now is is really this underpainting right here that I blocked in is really yellow. So I kind of have to <laughs> you know, we have to we have to and there are there are certain strategies to that. Now, Dasha, who is um she asked me earlier about reds. And sometimes, um, and I think uh, basically adding red and you're holding back on your reds a little. You have to be very, very careful because red will take over. Sometimes all you have to do is indicate uh, just a hint of red here, a hint of red there, 
and that's sort of enough to warm up that flesh tone and all of a sudden it changes the relationship and i'm gonna ex- i'm just gonna explain that right now because i just picked up a little bit of i have a teeny bit of cadmium red that i'm gonna kind of it's gonna end up blending with what i have that's the thing that I like about this RF pigments. It's, it's so buttery that you, when you take so, um, a color, you could take something straight and blend it in right here, and then it ends up being this cool kind of neat blended thing. <laughs> and I'm, I'm starting to add value right now. And I've, took, I've taken a little bit of cadmium, maybe a little bit of alizarin, crimson, and all of a sudden, do you see like the color relationships changing? I'm warming things up a little bit so she doesn't look so jaundiced, but it's like starting to make sense. It's starting to make um, like, okay, yes, it fits this color universe. Um, and then some cool things are starting to happen. Um, and I starting to like where it's going. Um, right now, I'm spending a little bit of time on the values. Now, this this uh, this base color has got to be again. When I mean a medium value, it's got to be something that's right kind of in the middle in terms of your value scale. That it's going to be light enough to be a flesh tone, but not so light that you can't add highlights to it to make them pop and come forward. And um, and not dark, not too dark, so that you can't um, darken the shadows. And whoa! Right now, I'm using an angled shader brush. I just it's a it's one of my go-to brushes. Um, if you're looking for something that you can get detail, I t- I, I tend to have a little bit of trouble. Um, controlling detail on a teeny tiny round brush, which is what your brain will tell you that's what you need to reach for. Um, instead of this, this angled brush, but, but believe it or not, you really can and go in and get detail. I could turn it on its side and get a pinprick with this angled brush. It's awesome. Um, so Um, I started to introduce value and now I'm paying a little bit of attention to shadows. Right now. And then in just a minute, I'm going to... How's your leg? Are you okay, Michaela? Are you needing a break? You're okay? Okay. All right. I'll keep, you know, I'll just keep going unless you pipe up. So, I know there's some, like, people are probably watching this on the internet going, oh my gosh, that green background is crazy. Um, but I like it, so, so there. (laughs) So ultimately, really we're kind of knocking out that the that uber yellow um sometimes i'll have my uh, 
my oil bar in my hand and then I need to just go in and grab a little bit and I put it on my brush and then I go in and I cut in with it. Again, I don't want you to think that I always grab this color. Um, this color is not going to work in every situation. I, when I'm, and I mean color, I mean that base of her flesh tone. Um, and only because I, I'm only choosing this color because we picked this really warm lighting on her, and it's that's actually it works. So. And I think I'm going to need to get a little bit wider brush now because I'm going to be doing, uh, I think I'll pick, yeah, I guess I'll use this one right here. I just grabbed a round brush. It's a number four, so I can color just a little bit more area. A word of caution, and uh, you'll probably hear this um, if you take any other um, uh, paint class, is fat on lean. So your, your thinner paints are going to be like underneath, but really that kind of has a lot to do with also if you add like medium, that's adding fat. So, um, to it, and right now I have no other medium on, on my, uh, that I'm using because um, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, um, I know enough artists who actually paint straight up, who paint on, um, Straight, uh, straight up with very little uh, using Mona Lisa thinner. I've experimented on my own using different mediums, and I found that I working straight up works a little bit better than for me. Uh, I don't do a lot of glazing. Uh, I, I, if I do, I do it very minimally. Um, but uh, this is probably much more of a direct painting. It's, a, it's not going to have a, a bazillion layers over days and days of work. This is maybe, typically my paintings take, sorry, a, 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 of a person, a, a just like a portrait. Uh, I can do in either one to two passes. So one more hour is not going to be as finished as let's say, you know, if I were to come back to it. And I probably, there's a good chance I will come back to it um, just to finish it out and um, post it. Okay, now I'm starting to pull some highlights. I'm starting to pull, um, and I'm pulling this one straight. Uh, again, the only reason I'm pulling it straight is because of the nature of these oil bars. They are, it's so... Um, it's so buttery. I have no other word for it. It's so buttery that um, there's a lot of blending that ends up happening right on the canvas that, um, that I like. And I don't have to do a lot of pre-mixing like I did down here, which is sort of its own other effect. But for some areas like up here, um, I'm not going to need to do that. So, uh, okay, I think what I am going to do here is I am going to need a little bit rosier highlights. I think that's what I need to do is some rosier highlights. We are using a rosy light after all, so it makes perfect sense to maybe, maybe have a little bit more of a pinkish highlight on her cheek. Yes, and that actually right there changes her 
complexion from being more yellow and we start to move towards more of that sort of peachy um, pink. I'm not here to really prescribe a formulaic approach to, to, to mixing colors and everything. I'm just really kind of hoping that maybe, if anything, you might glean a way of like negotiating this medium, this oil painting medium, and just trying to make it work for you and maybe bypassing some things that might end up being problematic or you simply don't know where to where to to begin where do you just where to start you okay Michaela So now it's no longer just this sort of jaundicey yellow, but I am going to, right there is a, an important highlight. I think that needs to be a little bit more rosy. So really, ultimately, that, that flesh tone that I put there is just a way to, number one, knock out my background color. Um, and if you were working white on white, you'd be doing, you'd still have to knock out the white that's underneath. And in my case, I'm sort of knocking out the color, but um, I like the way putting color on a, col a color background is, um, I like how just the color can pop off of, uh, just pop off of that surface. Um, So if you missed my comment earlier about I, tinting my canvas, I tend to tint my canvas because um, I hate fighting with the white of my canvas. Again, I know plenty of artists who just work off, right off a of white canvas and it works for them. And, um, and it's kind of cool to see how, you know, if they ever post prod uh, pr progress of their paintings, it's really kind of cool to see this mosaic of colors come together and make a painting. But for my own personal approach, um, it frustrates me more than it actually works for me. So you kind of have to find what works for you. Um, I, like I said, I really like working off of a, uh, a tinted surface or a color surface. And um, feel free to go and you can visit my um, Instagram page, which is instagram.com forward slash Rose Day Talk Doll. And you'll see my crazy color palette. <laughs> you'll see. Um, but I like, I like color and it kind of works for me. It's kind of my own thing. I'm kind of a color addict, to be honest, um, if there is such a thing. Uh, anybody who enters my house at home, my house is, my whole main level is like a robin's egg blue, turquoisey color, and I have yellow for, yellow couches and red for sure, and turquoise and white. It's, it's just kind of, that sounds awful, doesn't it? That sounds really like crazy, but it kind of works, and it's kind of fun. I don't know what my world would be without color.
I am watching the clock here. We have about a, probably a half hour more. Um, we're in an okay place. Um, you can kind of see some similarities here. That one's um, a bit rosier. The whole pain page is a little bit more blue. This kind of has more, more of a, um, um, it's a, a lot warmer on this canvas. But like I said, uh, color is all relative. And when you start adjusting colors on your canvas, you have to adjust them in relation to each other. And you either need to add their complement or you add, need to add them, you know, um, sort, of, sort of grade toward each other. Um, so basically what I mean by that is if you add a, 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 the complement of a color, you add a, a, a color and its complement, they tend to either, they kind of tend to grade towards each other. And in some ways that sort of makes them um, fit in the same color universe that you're, you're creating. And, um, yeah. So. All right. I'm now going to uh, pick out a little bit more of the detail now that I've kind of gone in and signed, kind of defined a f uh, some value, the values of some planes. Uh, that's another thing that will, what you, the planes of her face and the way they capture the light are, are going to be the cues of how you're, of what color you're going to grab. And this plane is warmer than that plane or there's a little bit on the plane under her chin. I see some reflected light that's cooler. Uh, sorry, warmer. <laughs> That's what I meant. Warmer. Um, so. So ever nudging it closer and closer to her her likeness. Just to let you know, in a half hour, we're, I guess that's the end of today's demo. Um, but you can catch us tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have another demo tomorrow uh, at 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And maybe what I'll do is I'll kind of post progress on this. Uh, I'll show you guys a little bit what we did from today. And totally need to make that longer here. That's okay. It's okay to make adjustments. I'm still really loose. Any adjustments I make at this point, it's, okay. it's still okay. I'm still loose. And I hope that that's kind of where you can be in your paintings, that if you feel like you discover, oh, my gosh, I need to make some adjustments or this is really off, that so there's, still, you're, there's still room for you to do that. Because really, still, this is quite loose. Um, and, it's, and I hope it's going to stay loose because I don't want any, any marks on my canvas that are going to look like it's um, forced or contrived. That's what we want to avoid. If you go to my Instagram page, the links are on, on there. If you go to my Facebook page um, and you're trying to figure out what link is this, I couldn't tell you because it's some crazy, crazy URL, but <laughs> it is a YouTube link, so you can watch this after the fact. It, once it's up on YouTube, I assume it's going to be up there, so um, you are able to access this demo if you kind of want to step away from it and come back to a watch um, watch part of it later um, after all that is a three-hour 
block for today's demo and three hours for tomorrow. So you can watch it. Um, go do something else, come back to it. So, okay, I'm going to grab my angle brush again. If you find that you're kind of starting to fight with your, your colors because um, you, I, 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 do, I do caution you that if you're going to thin your colors, you want to not thin them too much. If you, started to, if, if you put enough of an application of paint down, that, um, then you, if you add too much thinner, you're going to just wipe off what's underneath. Um, or your or some things from underneath are not blending the way that you like but are kind of make are becoming muddy that's the time for you to actually stop let your painting dry for if not a day sometimes um it just depends on what you're using like for these rf pigment sticks some of the colors take forever to dry and i kind of like uh, I, I might need to leave it for a couple days before I can go back to it. Um, but if uh, if you're just kind of using thinner um, and and you've just done a sort of a, a wash underneath with um, a, with some paint and some thinner, and then you can go and you can layer on top of that. But, um, and sometimes, uh, like I said, if you're finding that you're starting to fight with it, it sometimes it's just best to put it away for a, for a day or uh, come back to it. Um, and that certainly is okay to do. Sometimes it's better and healthier. Sometimes I have to do that. I probably takes me a day or two to do some of the ones that are most some of my more recent posts on Instagram um, if you're watching this link uh, if you're watching this on um, YouTube right now the spelling of my name is there so um, so if you went to instagram.com forward slash Rose day talk doll um, but I'll spell it out for you. It's R-O-S-E-D-A-T-O-C-D-A-L-L. -L. So you can, you can see some of the work and you can kind of see some of the more recent ones. Most of those have taken like a day or two. Probably no more than a couple passes. Uh, maybe three at the most, for, but not, not typically. Um, So this, um, I said earlier that I didn't really like to do wet on wet, but in some ways what I'm doing right now is sort of wet on wet because this base color is pretty wet. And what I'm going in is I'm sort of blending on top of it. And to that degree, I, I'm okay with using it, but I don't really like, tinting or just ta uh, taking thinner and just putting over my whole the whole surface area or tinting it with you know just um, a smear of um, umber um, that doesn't typically work uh, work for me um, very well however M my flesh tone tends up, uh, tends to be wet on wet. So to that end, I do like doing wet on wet. Because some neat things start happening. Are you okay, Michaela? You don't need a break? Do you need a break? Let's take a five minute break. You want, you're okay? Because we, um, actually we only have about 20 minutes left.
So you, it's up to you if you feel like you can you, you want to just go to 20 minutes and then because we're done at 20, 20 minutes. Okay, with at least the workshop. So um, I will say, bring out your iPhones, bring, in out, bring them out now so that you can take shots. If you want to come back to this, this pose, um, I'm saying this to my students. Uh, you there at home probably can't do that. <laughs> That's not going to work. Uh, I don't know exactly how you would do that at home. But yeah, so people are going to be moving around and, and taking shots of of the model. Now is a great time to do that. I will be doing that myself, um, but I probably will be using um, um, my other camera, my good cam. So. So um, I am using, again, this angled shader. It's really awesome for cutting into detail and getting lines. Um, I tend to have a very graphic style, so you're just going to have to to bear with my um, my edges, <laughs> I I I'm an edge girl. I like my edges. I love to. Uh, I like the element of line, and I I I. If I could liken my my brushstroke to anything, um, I I like. I like these angled brushes because it's almost like calligraphy. And so it's kind of like that. They're kind of, my, my lines tend to be calligraphic. And so if you kind of like that, you might like this angled brush. You might like doing that. For some people, some people absolutely hate it. Um, but it's got to, you know, it's, it's worth experimenting around with different brushes. And everybody's going to find their favorite brush. Everybody's going to have their favorite thing. And um, I'm kind of going to go um, as long as I, uh, I can. I'm just going to keep going with this. I'm actually not going to break right now to um, take pictures. I'll do that at the end so that I can just keep doing this demo for you to just keep um, keep you up on the progress. So nudging, nudging, nudging it ever closer to her likeness. That's the process. And if you, as long as you've built the framework for it, then that actually can happen. Um, and in, um, in the proper natural course of things, um, and adjusting and readjusting and that's okay as long as it's you know hopefully your framework is such that you can do that and not make any major having to make m major changes that completely have altered because all along the way you're you will have been making adjustments adjustments here and there. So again, um, we're, we're um, closing down the, the, the video uh, live stream in 15 minutes uh, and or a little bit less than 15 minutes but be sure to come back tomorrow we're going to be uh, doing another demo uh, tomorrow I am really going to hit it hard with portraiture um, I'm kind of doing that right now somewhat but I, I 
we're going to actually have two models tomorrow. And the reason why we're doing two models is because uh, there are 14, 15 of us here. And that's a lot to fit around one model. And we want everybody to get close. So it's going to be fun. Uh, I hope it's going to be fun for you guys. Um, instead of me doing two demos, I'm really just going to hit it hard and do one oil demo tomorrow. So I might have a more finished piece tomorrow to show you. And you can see the progress on um, more progress on that portrait. And we'll talk a little bit more about likeness. Uh, again, it, a lot of it might be similar to what you hear today, but uh, like I said, tomorrow we're going to have a much more finished product in the demo. At least that's the plan. You know, um, this is kind of one of those cool times where I'm like, oh, I could just like stop now and because there's some fun things that I really kind of, when I'm this close and I like certain things about it that it's kind of loose and unfinished. Um, it takes some discipline to tell yourself, okay, I'm stopping. I'm just going to stop. Because um, the temptation is to keep going, keep going, keep going, and then sometime, and then it's like, oh no, I've overworked it. So right now it's very. I, I can you guys see a little Degas influence in my work? I'm not. I promise you, I'm not imitating him on purpose. It just I, I get him. I get. I get his approach and it totally works with me. And when you, that's one of the things that you might end up um, exploring is find an artist that just, you just get, you just get. <laughs> that, uh, or there's something that with the way that they work that appeals to you and that can inform your, um, your process, can inform your approach. And, um, and there's several that are on my list that have informed my, my work and my whole approach. And so it's a combination of several different artists. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, you know, it, it, the goal is not to really imitate but to really sort of do your own, it, to make it your own. That's the goal of all artists out there, is to really just make it your own and make it work for you. And to really find that zone is the perennial pursuit of every artist. So I'm telling you, I don't necessarily expect you or want you to paint like me, but I want you to find those artists to whom you gravitate that can really help you and, and to that's why I'm 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 a big lover of art history and that, that actually was my major my major was art history with a fine art studio background and so I had a lot of exposure to lots of different artists and there were so many that I loved that taught me a lot I learned a lot by just looking at their work looking at their brush strokes looking at their their, the way they solve visual problems, the way, the way they handled their paint, that just really sort of excited me and excited my imagination. And, and I'm like, oh, I get that. Well, hopefully, especially for um, you guys that are art majors, that's, um, it's, a, it's a lifelong process, really. You're going to keep finding artists that you just love hopefully if you um, if you put yourself out there to look um, they're going to be those artists that just speak to you and um, 
hopefully those are the ones that are going to teach you um, teach you how to solve certain visual problems. Like I could look at uh, like Wayne Thiebaud. I love his, so, his so, uh, solution for colors. I love his use of edges. I'm an edge girl because I get it. It works the way uh, it works for me. I like I like um, Degas, just his his approach to um, the figure in, in, in his facile simplicity. He could just capture with a few strokes. He could capture the figure in such an uncanny way, and, and it's like less is better. Um, and it's just magic. So I want you guys, to hopefully you'll find artists that are, you know, that appeal to you and their work is just magic to you. And those are the ones that are going to teach you the most. John Singer Sargent, another one. His brushwork is just magic. I don't know how he, how he does it, but I've spent a little bit of time trying to decode, well, okay, how did he even lay down his strokes? What was his process? And I know Steve Houston has spent some time um, going through and doing some, uh, he'll go through and take a, um, a, a sergeant masterwork and he'll like replicate it um, in one of his, you know, tutorials. And, uh, and he picks out some things that Degas might do and it's, it's, it's quite informative and it's such a neat process to just really delve into the way an artist lays down his strokes and try as it, I might, the way that I lay down strokes is not going to be the way Sargent puts down his strokes. It's, it's going to be a different animal altogether when I'm done. And, and that's okay. I'm okay with that. Because I'm not trying to copy him. I'm trying, I'm trying to learn from him. Um, but hopefully, ultimately, um, I'm kind of at a place where I'm start, I've, I'm, I've kind of discovered my own thing, and that's where what every artist wants is to discover um, their own voice. To make something like the human figure fresh, keep it fresh and new, and, and relevant, um, that's a tall order. That's a really tall order to do human figure in a way that is, uh, that hasn't been done, I'm not going to say that hasn't been done, but in some ways that is just with fresh eyes, a fresh approach, that's a tall order. But that's my lifelong pursuit. <laughs> so for those of you who are watching again, there's only like five more minutes left of class. It's a shame you aren't here with us at the conclusion of this three-day workshop, um, which is today, which is Monday the 4th, and then we do the 5th, we do the 6th. Unfortunately, we are only um, airing today and tomorrow, but wish you could join us. We're going to be at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art on Thursday for some of the uh, students who are opting to do this optional portion of the workshop. We're just going to go there and have a fun, amazing day uh, drawing from the masters. So like I said, there's only about five minutes left of, of this live stream. So join us again tomorrow. Whoa. In my haste, as I said that, I laid down some color that wasn't properly mixed.
So basically, even though we're ending um, <clears throat> in just five minutes, <clears throat> the rest of the class, we're, um, we break for dinner and then we come back and, for we have open studio time. So for us, it's like three days of awesomeness. <laughs> I'll hope to do these workshops again um, from time to time as opportunities arise. And if SVU doesn't hate me, <laughs> maybe they'll invite me back. <laughs> so we did this last year, but we did not live stream it last year. It was, um, it, we had a great time last year. and. I hope we're just rocking it this year because I think everybody here just loves to have that block time to just focus on just getting uh, to draw from a, a, a draw or paint from a live model. That's such a treat. And we are pretty much done. So I guess uh, tune in tomorrow. Um, we're going to do the same thing at, from 2 to 5. Um, and again, it's a crazy URL, but if you go to my Facebook page, if you go to uh, from the art studio of Rose Day Talk Doll, let me spell that for you, Rose, R-O-S-E, and then Day Talk, D like David, A, T like Thomas, O, C, which is my maiden name, and then Doll, D like David, A-L-L. -L. So if you go to my, um, my studio page on Facebook, the links will be there. You can come in and check in tomorrow. You can also go to Instagram. You can go to um, Rose Day Talk Doll. So it's Instagram forward slash, sorry, Instagram.com forward slash Rose Day Talk Doll. Uh, and the links will be there. Um, so join us again tomorrow. So we're signing out. And uh, we'll check in again tomorrow. Bye.